quick note before we get started, this episode is available in two parts. This is the first part of Be More AI Aware. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Be More podcast, where we inspire you to be a little bit more of every role in the Salesforce community. Today's session, we are talking Be More AI Aware. It's important that you're aware of AI and the potential impact that you're having on AI, whatever your role in the ecosystem is, whether that's an admin, architect, developer, consultant, BA, designer, we, we all have our role to play. So today I'm joined by Ian Gotts. And without further ado, Ian, if you could introduce yourself. Hi there. So I'm the, uh, the co-founder and the CEO of Elements.Cloud. Uh, best way of describing me is three numbers, 10, 20, 30. So uh, 10 years as a consultant with Accenture, 20 years as a customer of Salesforce. Um, so actually, it's probably 22 now. So in, I live in America, so I'm allowed to drink now. It's 22 years <laughs> of Salesforce. And uh, 30, which is 30 years I've been involved in business analysis, change projects. So I've been on my soapbox about the importance of uh, understanding what you build before you start building it. Okay, perfect. And that's a great analogy for people to remember you by now. Um, so that's that's awesome. So for today's session, the questions are going to be around your role of being more AI aware. So to ease our audience into this, how would you describe that as a role? What's the day to day kind of responsibilities there, do you think? Well, so first of all, let, let's narrow this down. AI has been around since what? Well, Turing in the uh, the 1950s. So AI is a, a huge topic. Let's narrow it down to GPT and really what's happened literally in the last year in terms of what we've seen with chat GPT and the ability to almost have a conversation with a computer in natural language. And then the, the implications of that in terms of what we can do with our data, what we could do with managing our orgs, what we could do with documentation. So I think if we focus our thoughts on what we can do with GPT, then that, that that's that's I think the topic of the conversation. The the second thing that goes with that is that um, GPT is is a lot more than Chat GPT. I think a lot of people think of the bounds of what can be possible with just Chat GPT. GPT is way broader than that, and I think we're starting to see that play out in just a year how quickly things are evolving. But if if I if I use the phone analogy, we're still at the flip flown stage. We're nowhere near the iPhone end of it. There is so much more that it can do. So I think the important thing is not to go, okay, I've used ChatGPT. I understand what this is because and it, I'm involved in this every day. And every day I'm surprised by what can be, what's possible, what you can do, what, what the next thing is. So again, when we think about GPT, yeah, this is what you can do now, but think of us as the very early stages of what's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And how would you describe somebody that's aware of GPT and I guess the the impact that they're having on it? Um, what kind of phrases or, or words would you use to summarize that? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I, I think yeah I, yeah, I was I was at Thanksgiving and I talked to a number of people around the table who were, I know, someone who ran boards, someone who was a consultant, someone who just got a PhD. And their actually knowledge of understanding about what's possible with ChatGPT and GPT was very limited. And I think in the IT community, we're all over it. We expect everyone to know as much as we do because we're spending time thinking about it. Okay, so that's the first thing. GPT actually is a transformational change. What's possible with GPT in terms of productivity improvements is 100x. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, people are worried about AI taking your job or GPT taking your job. It's not going to. It's not going to replace you. But somebody who understands how to use it better than you is going to take your role. So we all need to get up to speed in what's possible because it. And I, for those of you who uh, remember the time before calculators, I mean, suddenly you <laughs> the calculator and you could do amazing math there just on this calculator. So those people who are still using slide rules or doing it by hand, the people with a calculator were doing it like 100 times faster. It's that same level of productivity enhancements uh, that we're seeing. So we all need to understand the potential of GPT and the different use cases um, and how it might apply, not just to inside Salesforce, but also outside some of the other activities. The ability to I know, write a specification, write a, a resume, write a job spec, write a requirement, uh, build an image for a blog, uh, tailor a blog. 
Um, so there are lots of places it can help. But I think the word help's really important. It's not doing this for you. Think of it as a really, really quick, hugely enthusiastic male intern. I use the word male quite deliberately because never in doubt, but not necessarily right. So it's very important about how you actually go and ask the questions and send this intern out to go and do what they want to go and then come back and validate the answers. So don't think of it as a replacement. Think of it as a really great productivity enhancer. The calculator doesn't do the math for you. It just makes you do that math faster. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So as somebody that's trying to be more aware of, of AI, how do you think that interacts with different roles in the ecosystem because obviously there's there's quite a few of different roles within the salesforce world like as an admin consultant developer how would that impact you perhaps differently obviously a, a kind of high level yeah okay so I, as i said it's a helper i think th mm -hmm. the idea that there's this generic gpt will will help everybody equally is not quite true what we need to is think about a specific use case so if you're an admin, you're thinking about a couple of things. You're thinking about maybe how GPT can help you write better documentation, which is about managing the org. GPT could help you understand and ask questions of your org, the stuff that we're doing with Elements GPT. We actually, you can ask natural language questions of your org. And what I mean by that is you could say, you know, um, the stage field on opportunity, can you tell me how long it will take to go and update all the things which are associated with it. And yeah. GPT, if it's got the right knowledge, can go look at the all, all the things which are dependencies of the stage field and all the things which are then dependent and dependent and dependent. Yeah. It then knows, if you give it a spreadsheet of, I don't know, if it knows the complexity of each of the things which it's touching, so a complex flow versus a simple flow, and, it's, and you also give it some information about how long you think an average complex thing takes to change and a simple thing to take change, it will go through and ripple through all those dependencies. And we've done this. We gave it three, three CSV files, metadata, dependencies, and the uh, estimate and the assumptions. And it came back and said 96 hours. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then we said, right, show you working. And it went, well, okay, I found this many things of that complexity, and that's why the number is what the number is. Okay, we still need to check what the, and validate those numbers. But that, re that, that would have been a really complex algorithm to write to go and do that. And it did a really good job of just understanding how to work its way through if we gave it the data. So yeah. that's a great example. But let me, let me just pull some threads on that. Number one, yeah. we, just, we didn't just say generically, what do you think? We actually narrowed it down and said, using this information I've given you, come back with some answers. So I think a lot of people think of GBT as like Google Google search on steroids. I'll ask it some questions. And that that's that's okay for going, tell me how flow works or tell me some some information, uh, informative type. But actually, if you want to do some work for you, these things are way, way better if you give it all the information and let it solve the puzzle pieces. So think of it not as Google search, but think of it as a really great puzzle solver you give it all the puzzle pieces and then use its reasoning capability to work out how the puzzle pieces fit together. And I think from an admin, that's how it's that's that's how we're using it for like, writing validation uh, rules. But we can use it for way broader things, such as tell me what's in the org. And we're yeah. starting to see examples of that uh, already. Uh, and we're at the very early stages. So that was the admin example. Yeah. I think about, say, someone who spends more of their time writing words, and GPT clearly. <laughs> So the consultants, yeah. the architects, the business analysts, again, GPT there, we're seeing the ability to write user stories, which are just like boring to write, and we're not very good at writing them. <laughs> it does a great job of writing user stories really accurately. Um, the other, maybe documentation, you could give it some bullet points, and it could flesh out those bullet points in terms of actually better documentation. Uh, right. And things, the reports you're writing. If you're a consultant, I can see people starting to write the structure of a, of a proposal and then getting it to then pull out all the details, uh, fill out the details for you. So again, getting you from zero to 70%, zero to 80%, it won't get you to 100%, but at least it's getting you quite a long way along the line. Um, with, with user stories, it's almost 100%. It, it does a great job taking a process map and writing user stories. So again, I'm, I'm putting out very different types of, uh, of um, Examples. I mean, yeah. another one would be: I got an error message here in Salesforce. What does that mean? 
provided you've it, it's reading the right information, it'll give you a reasonable answer. Um, mm -hmm. We need to be careful because I've, I, I I typed into one of these things. Uh, should I use a process builder workflow or a flow? And he went, no. Here are the pros and cons of using process builder workflows. Mm, no, yeah, no, no. yeah, it's not valid anymore. So again, way better at solving the puzzle pieces that you give it rather than asking for generic information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, the, I, and then I guess if I get into one other role type, developer. I mean, our developers. Okay, they use GPT every day. It in terms of uh, writing code, correcting code, writing test cases, it's really, really good at doing those things. So again, I'm pulling out very specific use cases based on those role types, but it's all bounded in the same same concepts of uh, it's going to come back with words. The better the prompt you give it, the more knowledge you give it to come up with the answers, the better the answers will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just touching a little bit on two things there, if I may. The first one, in terms of accuracy, am I right in thinking that it's now kind of up to 2021 and before in terms of the data that it has? For example, that, that very generic one about process builders or workflow rules, that's obviously a little bit outdated. If you're asking something like that, how recent is the information that GPT has available to it? That, that's a great question. Um, I think now it's actually uh, GPT-4 is now up, being taught up to 2023. But again, it's back to think of those use cases and then how can we actually feed it a lot more of our knowledge, the correct knowledge, so it can then answer the questions properly rather than relying what it's found on the internet. Because we all know the internet is full of a lot of information, which is true, and a lot of a lot of stuff is just not true. <laughs> yeah. So far better that we, if you were worried about the release notes, Give it the release note and then ask the questions of the release note. Because now it, you can actually attach files. So you could say, here is the release note. Now I'm going to ask you some questions about it. My other kind of question on that chain of thought, security. If you're giving it files and you are asking something of it, you're obviously potentially giving it some information that you shouldn't be, right? There, there's that risk. Of course. So, uh, so, I mean, a couple of things. I think people have probably had over-exaggerated the risk from a security perspective. Okay, so uh, let me take you back to 2007-ish when people said, we're never going to put financial services data in the cloud. We're never going to put pharmaceutical data in the cloud. Okay, we have Viva. We have Encino. People trust Salesforce to look after that data. Okay, so that's the first thing, which is, now I know, I know Salesforce isn't, training necessarily on that data but you've no idea you've got to trust salesforce is going to look after our data back it up is not going to do anything nefarious with it okay yeah i think when ai first kicked in and open ai started there was a big concern that any data we give we're going to give it was going to start uh, obviously teaching the models now first of all it in its policies it's saying it's not doing that secondly you can actually there are some check boxes to go no i don't want you to i don't want you to do certain things um finally they're actually the data retention is 30 days, but if you're someone like Salesforce, you, they've got an agreement, I think, where it's zero days where any data is held. So I think the security risks are lesser than people expect. And, and I think the other point that goes with that, if, if you're going to happy to trust your data to Salesforce, you've then got to take a view about, are you happy trusting your data to I know, OpenAI or Google or whoever else that is? And if, and if it is a big issue, then maybe have a lot, you'll run your own large language model internally. The same way as people are going, I'm never going to put my data in the cloud. I'm only going to run it on my own servers. And it's the same sort of discussion that we're having. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing, though, is, okay, I get it if you're putting customer data out there. Yeah. 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 But if you're yeah. saying, I've got a release note here, or I've got a bunch of metadata in my org, can you make sense of it for me? Really? Is that actually if no. someone are they <laughs> yeah. for that? If they are, hire them because they'll help yeah. you. So um, I think we need to look at the relative levels of security and the sorts of things we're doing. Mm. Your, uh, the audience we're talking to are predominantly there managing Salesforce. We're not pushing data in and out of. Uh, we're not taking customer data and putting it into GPT necessarily. Let, we can pick that up in a in a moment. That's about what Salesforce is now enabling you to do with GPT, which is different from what you can do with just the standard GPT tools that are out there, whether it's 
OpenAI's ChatGPT or ChatGPT Plus. Awesome. And there are other tools out there as well. Personally, I prefer the the interface of of Bard a little bit better than than ChatGPT. Like, what other ones have you you come across? Because there's there's other ones that kind of do video, and there's one that, that do images, and there's, there's a whole host of tools. Right? It's exploding. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, Bard is Google. Uh, the other big one. The three big ones are OpenAI, which is ChatGPT. It's obviously Bard with Google. Anthropic's got something called Claude. So there, there are the, they're the, they're the three big players. Um, but every every release they come up with, it, they are they're they're providing more capabilities. So an interesting thing that ChatGPT came up with a week and a two, week and a bit ago was yeah. the idea of a custom GPT. Yeah. So you can take the same GPT interface from ChatGPT, but you can then build what's called a custom GPT. What that means is think of a narrow scope. You could say, I want you to write uh, customer case studies. So you give it a, a file, which is a transcript of a video interview, and then say, build me a customer case study. But what you can do with a custom GPT is with this narrow scope, you can give it some knowledge. You give it a set of instructions. This is how I want you to behave. You can give it knowledge articles. So this is my standard case study structure. These are the terms that I always use. These is, this is our tone of voice. Yeah. Okay. And then you can say, do not use anything out your knowledge of the internet. Purely build my case study based on the attachment, which is the transcript, and use my knowledge articles for, and use my instructions. Okay, so people are now building these narrower scoped custom GPTs. So the one could be about helping you do process mapping better. One could be about, I know, uh, thinking about architecture. Yeah. And so we're seeing lots of people building these custom GPTs, embedding their knowledge, right, whether it's books or articles or their knowledge into these things, and then and a specific instruction set to make it give you far better answers. And so some of those GPTs are public. Yep. So anybody can find them and use them, but some of them are private, ones that you build for your own productivity. You don't want to share them. You might share them with your colleagues, but you're not going to share them with the whole world <laughs> because they've been yeah. optimized for you. So like the ones that we built for I know, our product management team use or the ones that our marketing teams use, we've built those specifically because they're tailored for the elements tone of voice. They use the elements colors. Mm -hmm. We've given it a set of instructions that work really well for us. So we've taken the sort of generic, oh, GPT can do anything, and then taken it down to a narrow. We've got 10, 15, 20 helper apps that we use called custom GPTs. Uh, yeah. But to build these GPTs, you need to be on the Plus program, and to use them, you need to be on the Plus program, which is the 20 bucks a month. But uh -huh. the sort of productivity gains we're seeing of at 10x, 100x for different activities, okay, 20 bucks is, is a small price to pay. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, and I think... Certainly, if you were to to try it out, or it sounds a little bit like you might have done this, it's quite easy to solidify the business case of renewing the subscription. I'm not sure how the model works, but when you start to see the results and put the value against the cost, right? Right. That's all we have time for for part one. Tune in to part two to find out more and dive into the art of prompting. Thanks for tuning in to Be More with Tom Bassett. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave any feedback in the comments.